chapter 18 from Simon Reynolds, Rip It Up and Start Again, post-punk 1978 to 1984. Fun and Frenzy, Postcard and the Sound of Young Scotland, Orange Juice, Joseph K, The Fire Engines, The Associates. In 1980, when post-punk seemed locked in a gloom-laden death strip, everything about Orange Juice felt different. The, Glasgow's, the Glasgow group's very name was refreshing. Sweet, wholesome, sunshine in a glass. None of us drank alcohol at the time, singer-guitarist singer Edwin Collins recalled. Orange Juice seemed perfect because it was what we drank at our rehearsals. The music, a spring-heeled shambles of birds and velvets, felt like a tonic too. Above all, their debut single, Falling and Laughing, released in the spring of 1980, signalled the return of unabashed romance. Renouncing post-punk's demystification, Collins proclaimed the sacred singularity of his sweetheart. You say there's a thousand like you, well maybe that's true, I fell for you and nobody else. You could trace Collins' fey, bashful voice, the sound of lovesick schoolboys, as one journalist put it, back to the glorious, lump-in-the-throat wetness of Pete Shelley. When Buzzcocks played their first dates in Scotland as part of the White Riot Tour in 1977, they had more impact on the local scene than headliners The Clash. Buzzcocks subverted people's ideas about what a punk group should be like, said Collins. I thought they were very witty, very camp. Another White Riot tour group also enjoyed a disproportionate influence in Scotland, Subway Sect. Collins thrilled to the sparks and splinters flying off the sect's abrasive, abrasive guitars. Rob Simmons' Fender Mustang was completely out of tune, the treble cranked up full, he recalled. You could also hear a touch of Vic Goddard in Orange Juice's lyrics the preference for charmingly quaint, staunchly un-American language, like the chorus, goodness gracious, you're so audacious. Colin simpers archly in, on, in a nutshell. Orange Juice talked and acted in a way that broke with both Rock's rebel swagger and post-punk's militant solemnity. They were literate, playful, ironic, quirky. Everyone used to think we were a bunch of androgynous little twits, Collins said. The exaggerated wimpiness was a revolt against the Glasgow music scene's traditional blues, rock, machismo, Frankie Miller, Nazareth, Stone the Crows, but also against the hooligan stunt menace of Scottish punks like The Exploited. Simply Thrilled Honey, their third single, made sensitivity subversive. Based on a real incident, it depicted Collins as a shrinking violet, the reluctant prey of a female seducer. Collins told Sounds, I didn't want to go to bed with her. I wasn't sexually attracted to her, but above all, I didn't love her. And I think it's really important to only go to bed with someone you, if you love them. That's what the line, worldliness must keep apart from, must keep apart from me, means. There is such a pressure on boys to be manly. I find going to bed with someone you don't love disorienting or disorientating. In Consolation Prize, Orange Juice's loveliest song of all, Collins tries to woo a girl away from her boyfriend, a mean mistreater who has crumpled up her face in tears countless times, whereas Edwin makes her laugh with his so frightfully camp Roger McGinn fringe. Collins even contemplates buying a dress to cheer her up. I'll be your consolation prize, he pleads. In the end, he's resigned to remain unrequited, but as Orange Juice's golden cascades of guitars propel the song towards a climactic slow fade, Collins almost rejoices in the fact that I'll never be man enough for you. He sounds exultant rather than mournful, triumphant, not defeated. Orange Juice all came from Beersden, a middle-class suburb of Glasgow. I met Edwin on a school bus, recalls drummer Stephen Daly. James Kirk, our guitarist, was already my friend. On the bus, Edwin was reading Melody Maker. Not the magazine to read then, and I joked. Not the magazine to read then, and I joked. You, didn't, you don't just read that, you don't read that old shit, do you? We were all music press slaves. 
The first pieces on CBGB came out in 1975. We were very interested in what was going on in New York. Television and talking heads had figured out more viable new ideas than most British punk bands. Indeed, when the fledgling Orange Juice put a Musicians Wanted advert in a local fanzine, the first line announced, a New York band forming in the Beersden area. As much as the current CBGB bands, Orange Juice were united in a love of an earlier New York supergroup, the Velvet Underground. Collins would place live 1969 on his dance set and leave it playing on repeat for hours while he potted around his flat. Live 1969's gatefold sleeve showed a Lou Reed holding a country gentleman guitar manufactured by Gretsch, a make that would that look on a tal a make that took on a talismanic talismanic significance for Orange Juice. We avoided the two major rock guitars, the Fender and the Gibson. Playing Gretsch's was about bringing back a 60s sensibility, but still having the freneticism of punk. Nobody else used them at the time. The core of Orange Juice's sound was the sparkling drive of rhythm guitar played at double time to the drum beat. The idea came half from the late era Vel Velvet and half from Chic. Disco was the wild card in Orange Juice's musical mix. Before punk, Collins had been a regular at church hall youth dances and the Glasgow discotheque shuffles. The thing about us blending Chic and the Velvets, it really sound, it sounds really audacious on paper, but if you listen to Live, nine, Live 69, the double time rhythm guitar on rock and roll is not a million miles apart from Nile Rogers' guitar playing in Chic, says Daly. Very clipped. Not jangly, which, which is the cliche journalists always applied to orange juice. The strings are actually being dampened, so it's more choppy than jangly. In 1978, a 19-year-old uber hipster and botany student called Alan Horn witnessed a gig by Orange Juice, then trading as the new Sonics, and was struck by two things. Their cover of We're Gonna Have a Real Good Time Together, an obscure velvet song only ever captured on Live 1969. Cooler still, an associate of the band came on stage to chant the refrain from Schick's recent UK hit Dance Dance Dance, Yowza Yowza Yowza. Daly had already met Horn through his job at a record shop called Listen. We got talking. Alan was an interesting, overamped character, recalls Daly. After checking out the band, the abrasively opinionated Horn offered them some unsolicited advice. He probably told us we were shit, said, says Daly, but he could see the potential. In particular, Horn detected star quality in Collins. In typically prickly fashion, though, he greeted the singer, who was dressed in Levi's motorbike boots and a plaid shirt, with, Look at the fucking wimp. You're like Joy Bon Walton. For his part, Collins remembers Horn wearing a Harris tweed jacket and hidden under the lapel was a little Nazi badge. A fan of provoca provocation for its own sake, Horn liked to flirt with fascist symbols purely as a wind-up. He wanted to come on stage with us wearing lederhosen and do springtime for Hitler from the producers, says Collins. It all came out of being part being a glam fam, cabarets, Berlin decadence, Lou Reed having the Iron Cross shaved in his hair on the Rock and Roll Animal tour. 1978 was when Rock Against Racism and silly things like that were going on and Alan quipped, I'd rather have a movement called Racism Against Rock. He also did a fanzine which featured crude little cartoons of Brian Superstar, his flatmate, in a Nazi uniform. Superstar and Horn both exemplify that music scene syndrome of catalyst figures who don't necessarily contribute musically, but shape opinion and impart esoteric knowledge. Horn was a connoisseur of pre-punk music and owned boxes of classic 45s, ranging from Electra's psychedelic rock to Northern Soul. Superstar, later a member of the Scottish indie cult band The Pastels, would hip you to things, says Staley. There was so little material available in those days, you literally could not find the cool records because record companies deleted them. But Brian would spend the extra time, but Brian would spend, spend the extra time and money to find the exotic stuff, like Graham Parsons say. He also had a VCR, something almost unheard of back then. We'd watch certain videos over and over, like this History of Rock program that showed the birds doing Mr. Tambourine Man. A whole at Golden Age was brought back to life by this documentary. 
All this archival, arcana and period detail informed Orange Juice's retro-electric approach to piecing together an identity, their take jang an, an identity. They'd take jangly lead guitar lines from the more country-influenced 60s rock of The Birds and Love and Spoonful, says Daly, but combine that with a touch of 70s soul, or they'd mismatch subway sect guitar scratch with a disco walking bass line. It doesn't surprise me that Stephen Daly has since become a journalist, because he, he was the most analytical one of all of us, says Collins. He used to say, oh, I like this sound on this record, and maybe we should take this sound from another record. And this was all pre-sampling. The same applied to the way Orange Juice constructed their image. With Brian's videos, you could see what the group were wearing, says Daly. Scrutinising the history of rock and their favourite album covers, such as Pet Sounds, Orange Juice came up with a melange look. Mod-style suede suits, hooped t-shirts redolent of Warhol's factory, Credence Clearwater Revival-inspired plaid shirts, raccoon hats, plastic sandals. Strikingly different from the monochrome post-punk norm, the group's appearance gave off intriguingly mixed signals. Several different phases of the 60s, Americana, rock scholarly know knowingness, childhood innocence. Falling and Laughing was Orange Juice's first release, jointly financed by Horn, Collins and Orange Juice bassist Dave McClymont. But because Horn wasn't in the band, band, he gradually took on the role of manager and boss of the label, which they christened Postcard. It suited his pushy personality. Alan loved it when you'd jokingly call him Mr Postcard, recalls Colin. He wanted to be the Svengali figure. He was a control freak. As well as running Postcard, he was sort of managed... He sort... He also sort of managed all the groups on the label. The punk managers interested him. McLaren, Bernie Rhodes, Kay Carroll with The Fall. Alan used to say that the great thing about, po about punk is that it's brought in an era when the manager is, where the manager is as important as the group. Because in early punk interviews, the manager often, often assumed the same importance as the singer. Other punk era managers operating in the provinces started labels purely as a way of garnering attention, attention for their bands. The independently released single figured as a superior form of demo tape, indicating gumption and determination. Horn was more ambitious. He wanted to get Orange Juice into the pop charts without resorting to the major label system. He intended to have hits, but do it independently. Horn was one of the very first people to sense that the independent charts charts had become a low horizon for bands. Music should always aim for the widest possible market, he proclaimed, in one of the first music paper features on Postcard. The charts are there. That's where you need to be. Borrowed a, borrowing a phrase from Dexy's Kevin Rowland, he mocked the brown rice independents for their hippie attitude of dropping out and staying pure. To get Postcard's records distributed, though, Horn had to deal with rough trade, as brown rice as they came. The relationship between the motormouth Speedy Horn and the deceptively soft-spoken but tenacious Jeff Travis was understandably frictional. I really loved falling and laughing, says Travis, but I was a little disappointed by the second single, Blue Boy, and I wasn't particularly impressed by Alan's hustle when they came down to London looking for a distribution deal. Then I changed my mind and realised I had made a mistake. I offered them a good deal, which Alan then told everybody was a deal, that would bankrupt rough trade. But, you know, Alan wanted to have an abrasive relationship with everybody because he thought he was Warhol. Horn also knew that John Peel's support was crucial for independent releases, especially those from outside London. But Peel had actually been a hippie once, and his Radio 1 show represented everything Horn despised about the new post-punk DIY ghetto. So he barged his way into the BBC and berated Peel, insulting the music the DJ played. Just a nice bore, and warned him that Postcard was the future, and either you'll get wise to that or you'll look very stupid. The intimidation backfired. As Edwin Collins recalled, that night Peel said on the air that he'd been confronted by a truculent youth from Glasgow. Peel added that he was going to play Falling and Laughing, but only once.
Given how peripheral Glasgow was back then in relation to the rest of the UK music scene, Postcard depended on the weekly music press. The papers were our only hope really, says Daly. The record industry was clueless and had to be told where to look. So who told them where to look? The music press. We thought if we send out this message in a bottle, Paul Morley at the NME and Dave McCulloch at Sounds will listen. We'll get it. Morley and McCulloch had been the most prominent champions of Joy Division in their respective papers. In the summer of 1980, hit hard by Ian Curtis's suicide, both writers were looking for something affirming, a post-punk path that led away from the literally dead end of despair represented by Closer. The postcard sound arrived in the nick of time. Post-punk had dried up, says Daly. I liked Pills or Public Image Limited's metal box, but it was pointing people in a bad direction. So Orange Juice was turning away from the dark side, and we were very influential on what ended up being called New Pop. We struck a nerve with the media-conscious people, the future tastemakers. We were very clever, meta-aware, and having fun with it. Orange Juice's sense of humour was crucial. That was why their debut single was called Falling and Laughing. In this song, Collins proposed a merry sense of one's own absurdity as a salve for love's humiliations. What can I do but learn to laugh at myself? Love tore you apart again, again and again. But in Orange Juice's world, heartbreak always came with a side order of quips. Orange Juice remained postcard's priority, but Horn began filling out the label's roster with other Scottish talents, such as Glasgow's Aztec Camera and Edinburgh's Joseph Kay plus honorary Caledonians, the go-between, who hailed from Australia, but had a spare, plangent sound similarly rooted in television and early talking heads. The sound of young Scotland, Horn called it, in a nod to Motown, whose hit factory approach he admired. Postcards, sleeves, played on tartan patterns and other cliched Scottish imagery, as if they were a branch of the Scottish tourist board. Joseph Kay came through daily, who'd quit Orange Juice for a, ta- for a while and started his own label, Absolute. In Edinburgh, he had met Malcolm Ross, guitarist in a band called TV Art. Daly convinced them the original name was terrible, and they came and they became Joseph, or Joseph K. after the protagonist of Kafka's The Trial. Horn wooed Daly back into the orange juice fold by, accom- by accompanying him on a trip to London to pick up Joseph K.'s debut single from the pressing plant, and helped Daly take them to distributors like um, like Small Wonder. Orange Juice and Joseph K formed a sort of alliance, said Ross. They'd support us in Edinburgh, we'd support them in Glasgow. Like Orange Juice, they had a clean image, sharp monochrome suits from Oxfam, and a clean sound. They also liked a lot of the same music, the cerebral side of American punk, groups like Television, Pear Ubu, Talking Heads, The Voidoids. I never saw any of the New York groups as part of rock and roll, All those mouldy old bands with long hair, says frontman Paul Haig, who had been playing guitar for a while when he heard Marky Moon in the record shop where he worked. I just thought, that's how you should play guitar. I much preferred television's crisp, clear sound to the blasting of the Clash and the Pistols. Malcolm and I went to London to see Talking Heads, nine hours on the long-haul coach, and then back again, sleeping in a bus shelter. We were half asleep at the actual gig because we were so tired. Inspired by Talking Heads 77 and Subway Sect, Joseph K tried to get their sounds to set, get their guitars to sound as toppy as they could, says Ross. It was just a matter of avoiding distortion and turning the treble up full. We like playing really fast rhythms, and if you needed a really sharp sound for those to work using distortion, and you needed a really sharp sound for those to work, using distortion meant you'd lose the effect. Coiled and keen, barbed and wired, Ross's and Haig's guitars careened off the fast funk groove churned up by bassist David Weddle and drummer Ronnie Torrance. <clears throat> in the very early days, it was just me playing guitar with Ronnie drumming up in his attic, says Haig. Ronnie, Ronnie had always followed my, my rhythm bass, rhythm guitar, and we carried that into Joseph, Joseph K. He'd never listened to the bass like drummers are supposed to do. The resulting strange chemistry between Torrance's all-out exuberance and the scratchy guitars gave Joseph K gave Joseph K their frenetic moment, momentum. (sighs) 
Joseph K's disco punk had a similar flustered quality to Orange Juice's chic Velvet's rhythm guitar. And Haig's singing midway through Lou Reed and midway between Lou Reed and Frank Sinatra was as strikingly unrock and roll was as strikingly unrock and roll as Edwin Collins's voice. But the overall Joseph K sound was harsher, and the songs came from a less optimistic place. Haig was a literally fragile fing- figure, almost anorexic, down to seven stone eleven pounds, and I'm six foot tall. I was just depressed, and I didn't eat very much. I got obsessed with looking at calories and what I was eating. At that point, I was fading away to nothing. One of Joseph K's best songs, It's Kind of Funny, was inspired by Ian Curtis's death. I loved Joy Division and was really freaked out that he could take his own life, aged 23, recalls Haig. Just the thought of how easy it was to disappear through a crack in the world. Nevertheless, he stresses that It's Kind of Funny, while not a happy song, was still saying you don't have to be depressed about life, you can still laugh about it. Throughout the Joseph K. songbook, Haig sounds high on anxiety, playing an odd giddy euphoria in doubt. Sorry, finding an odd giddy euphoria in doubt. Nourished by an intellectual diet of penguin modern classics and European existentialism, songs like Sorry for Laughing, There's Too Much Happening, and Radio Drill Time, We Can Glide Into Trance, addressed man's endless struggle. On their masterpiece, Endless Soul, the singer's suave croon surfs the fraught glory of Joseph, of Joseph K's guitars, as if trying to strike the correct flattering posture in the face of the absurdity of being alive in a godless vacuous universe, as Haig puts it. Critics love the band's literate lyrics and the music's weird mix of poison frenzy, but despite the rave reviews, Alan Horne was never sure about the band. Alan had this vir- vision for Orange Juice all along, says Haig, to turn them into a great pop band, but he found Joseph K far too abrasive and dark. He wanted us on the label label to add some cred and widen its output, but the cockroach became became too fat on a diet of Kafka and press clippings. Books shaped Joseph K as much as music, Kafka, obviously, but Camus, Hess, Dostoevsky and Knut Hamsen. Knut Hamsen. Reading gave me so many ideas for lyrics, said Haig. In those days, I never thought about politics for one second. I was only trying to protect, project thoughts about the human condition. Orange Juice were into a different kind of literature. Edwin would, would, would be reading Catcher in the Rye while we'd be reading The Trial. That explains a lot about the differences between the bands. Joseph K quickly found themselves at the epicenter of an Edinburgh scene of post-punk bibliophiles. There was a certain period in Edinburgh when all the new wave bands were into reading, remembers Haig, laughing. Davy Henderson from The Fire Engines, Ross Middleton from Positive Noise, Richard Jobson from The Skids. You'd always see them with a book in their pocket. The city's post-punk literati, always literati, haunted a pub called the Tap of Lauriston, directly opposite Ed- Edinburgh's art college. Like the members of Orange Juice, though, Joseph Kay weren't much for drinking. Ross, Haig and Weddell struck, stuck mostly to soft drinks. Only Torrance would have a pint or several. It was as if all the band's rock and roll rock and rollness was concentrated in the body of their drummer. At gigs would leave the rider untouched, but Ronnie would stuff all the beer in his drum bags, recalls Haig. Torrance's appearance also stuck out like a sore thumb. Joseph K had this band camaraderie thing and would all wear long grey raincoats, except for Ronnie, who'd sometimes upset us greatly by wearing yellow trousers and pointed blue suede shoes. Ron was into the whole rock and roll trip. He'd even get groupies. We'd never got groupies. Joseph K, says Ross, didn't like laddishness or sexism. If girls came back to the dressing room to talk, to talk, we wouldn't be trying to get off with them or anything like that. Orange juice were just the same. 
We were a cute band dressed in an interesting style, so we had bad girls so we had girls following us, but I don't think we took advantage, recalls Daly, with a hint of wrist- wistfulness. I remember opportunities to take advantage and not doing it. It seems absolutely ridiculous in retrospect. We were pretty naive lads. In an early sounds feature on Postcard, Dave McCulloch tagged the label's sensibility as New Puritan, a term borrowed from Marquis Smith. Orange Juice, Joseph K and Aztec Camera all frowned on drugs and excessive drinking. All frowned on drugs and excessive drinking. We were quite puritanical, says Ross. We didn't smoke dope or believe in getting drunk. Spending a little bit, speeding a little bit was acceptable. Amphetamine related to the mod thing of being in control and alert. I wanted some kind of dignity. As part of their anti-rock stance, Joseph K never played encores. I always used to find encores patronising, says Ross. The roadies would come on to pack up the guitars, but if you clap loud enough, the band would come on again. That was the kind of ritual that Postcard wanted to change. Haig also refused to indulge the audience with banter or pleasantries. Instead, Paul taped intros to the songs that would play over the PA. We were into all these Brechtian alienation techniques. Haig recalls being barely able to bring himself to utter the word gig because it was too disgustingly rock and roll. I prefer to say concert, but you couldn't really say that when you were just playing a wee venue. When it came to anti-rockism, Joseph K were surpassed by the Fire Engines, another great Edinburgh, po- Edinburgh group of this era, who famously played sets that lasted only 15 minutes. What's the point in getting the audience bored? demanded singer Davy Henderson in NME. Where's the value in that? Is, the, is it the amount of time you're on or the amount of excitement you get out of it? Yet another Scottish group triggered into existence by Subway Sect, the fire engines added beef heart barbs and contortions jolts to create a sound of prickly, itchy energy. On their archetypal tune Discord, high-toned beetling bass and looping drums create a nervous, hyperactive funk. The guitars throw out electric sparks like live wires that are cut and writhing, while Henderson yelps like a pixie version of James Brown at his most agitated. Horn desperately wanted fire engines for postcard, but so did Bob Last of Fast Product, who was based in Edinburgh. Like Horn, Last believed that independent culture was in danger of becoming a ghetto, but up to this point, they'd had, a very, diff- they'd had very different ideas of how to escape from it. Horn wanted to break the major label's stranglehold on the pop charts with postcard. Last wanted Fast Product's acts, such as spiky pop outfit The Scars, to sign to a major as soon as they could. Unsurprisingly, a bristling rivalry developed between the two men and their labels. It intensified when Horn, all set to release a Fire Engine's live tape on his projected sub-label, I Wish I Was a Postcard, was outflanked by Last, who whisked the band into the studio to record the, the release, to, to record the first release for his new label, Pop Oral. Ironically, the Pop Oral concept was very similar to Postcard. I dissolved fast and started Pop Oral because I wanted to experiment with becoming more commercial, he says. Just like Horn, he wanted to see if it was possible to break into the top 40 while remaining independent. The Fire Engines Lubricate Your Living Room, the record that launched Pop Oral, wasn't exactly pop music, though. For a start, it was mostly instrumental, give or take the odd stray chant or shriek of excitement from Henderson. It, wasn't, it certainly wasn't a single, but a deliberately unclassifiable release. Nine tracks stretched across a 33 RPM 12, 33 RPM 12 inch, selling at the budget price for an album of £2.49. Yet Henderson stressed that Lubricate shouldn't be taken as the Fire Engine's debut album either. Instead, it was a sort of dub remix of, debut, of the debut LP before it existed. It's like our songs with the words taken away and the lengths extended. It was Bob Last's idea, and he wanted to use us, and we were quite into getting used in this type of way. Echoed in the title of the track, Get Up and Use Me, Last's governing concept was useful music, as opposed to art for passive consumption. Background beat for active people. Lubricate was the hyperkinetic opposite to chill out music, or opposite of chill out music or Eno's ambient soundscapes. Something to vibe yourself up before you went out for the evening. 
On its release in January 1981, Lubricate was a, was a critical smash and a big independent hit. But the fire engine's wonderfully frangible music fell a long way short of the chart infiltrating pop last envisioned for pop oral. The fire engines were a transitional thing because they weren't glossy, he says. For the next single, Candy Skin, last hard half a dozen string players, not as expensive as you might imagine, to add a hilariously incongruous symph symphonic patina to the group's jagged sound. The fire engines were so abrasive, you could get away with it using a string section without it being kitsch. But after a while, I told them they couldn't undo what they were doing, because it'd just be less of the same. So they reinvented themselves as Win, a proper pop group. The Associates, Edinburgh's third and greatest group of this period, were the city's real deal pop proposition. Unlike Joseph Kay or Davy Henderson's mob, they would eventually go all the way. Singer Billy McKenzie had a multi-octave voice and the supernatural glow of a born star. The band's multi-instrumentalist musical director Alan Rankin was gorgeous, his dark, sultry looks making the perfect visual chemistry between McKenzie's pale, vaguely aristocratic cast. Malcolm Ross and I went to see the first ever Associates gig in Edinburgh at the Aquarius Club, recalls Paul Haig. They looked amazing. They all had on red silk shirts. We started to become friends because Joseph Kay and the Associates played together so many times. Billy became my absolute soulmate, off his head, but in a good way. Before the Associates, Rankin and Mackenzie had earned a good living as members of cabaret ensemble Mental Torture. At their hotel residencies, they performed campy remakes of showbiz standards. Shadow of Your Smile became Shadow of My Lung. And original songs like Rocky Horror like Not Tonight Josephine. Uh, Not Tonight Josephine. Shortly after they'd originally met, Mackenzie moved in with Rankin and they started writing loads of songs. Bill was a fizzing mental flatmate, says Rankin. One time he absentmindedly put the plastic kettle on the gas oven and it melted. Mackenzie buzzed with a sort of innate speediness. You could always tell there was something unsettled deep within him. Bill could never just switch off, unless it was watching a wildlife documentary on TV. He saw animals as pure, having this grace and nobility he admired, something he didn't see in humans. With animals, there was no agenda, no bullshit. Rankin and Mackenzie decided to give up entertaining middle-aged hotel patrons and have a stab at full-blown art pop. As the associates, they developed a sound based on their mutual appre appreciation for the more eccentric end of glam, Roxy music, sparks, disco and movie scores. We shared a massive love of the grandeur of film soundtracks, said Rankin. We catalogued the whole thing, worked out what the composers were doing to play on people's emotions with no lyrics. And then we put those tricks and that language into what we were doing. We threw in everything but the kitchen sink. When we recorded, we never had enough time, time or tracks. Both men shared the view that during the progressive rock era, 1968 to 75, the art of classic songcraft had died through being smothered by exhibitionistic instrumental virtuosity. And yet, ironically, Rankin was one of the post-punk's eras was one of post-punk era's greatest guitarists. There was a def definite period of around 1979 to 81 where, because of the setup in bands, just guitar, bass, drums, vocal, it was the guitarist who virtually carried the can for all the sound textures in the group, he says. I was just trying to use the most basic effects, like the Roland Space Echo turned up to full, to make the biggest sounds I possibly could just to back up the grandeur of what Bill was trying to do vocally. You've got to remember he had no backing vocals harmonising with him. I tried to make a wall of sound without sounding like punk thrash. Post-punk was all about the creeping back in, in the creepy. Post-punk was all about the creeping back in of degrees of subtlety, giving the song a chance to breathe. The associate's sound mixed post-punk modernism, the ice burn spires of Rankin's guitar, and the most postmodern and the more postmodern traits of the new pop. 
In the associate's case, that meant flashbacks to the stylized romance of bygone forms, interwar torch songs, post-war musicals, Sinatra-style crooners, Scott Walker's orchestrated solo albums. Mackenzie's towering vo vocals conjured an era when the malady of love was expressed in epic proportions, when singers luxuriated in grief. There was a hell of a German thing. There was a hell of a Germanic thing going on in our music too, says Rankin. Billy got that from Kraftwerk. He liked their starkness. A lot of Bill's vocal melodies are not rhythmic. They're stately. They've got a dignity to them. He was very conscious that he didn't want to get into things that were too obviously rhythmic, because that would have been too Americanized. It's only in retrospect when you've got a whole body of work when you notice, wait a minute, how come we haven't got one song that's really groovy and with some overt sexuality to it? And yet the music was erotic in its textured sensuousness, while Mackenzie was nothing if not a highly sexual being. It's the weirdest thing. I knew Bill was gay from the moment I met him in 1960, 1976, but it really didn't cross my mind again, says Rankin. When we were recording, Bill would sometimes disappear from the studio for six hours at a time, and I'd think maybe he's off walking around getting ideas for lyrics or just clearing his head. But for all I know, he was out, he was out cruising for six hours. Mackenzie was actually more omnisexual than gay in any strictly defined sense, or as Rankin put it more bluntly, He'd shag anything with a pulse, but the serious side of him was that this was a guy who was constantly questioning himself. He was striving for the third sex. Mackenzie himself declared, I'm not the type of person who sees beyond genders. I don't have, excuse me, I'm the type of person who sees beyond genders. I don't have many emotional boundaries or hang-ups about who I like, where I like, when I like. I can swing with the best of them. For their self-released debut single, The Associates covered Bowie's Boys Keep Swinging. As a way of announcing themselves to the world, it neatly combined homage to one of the biggest influences on Mackenzie's vocal style and sheer hubris. Their version came out in late 1979, only months after Bowie's original had left the charts. The single caught the ear of Friction Records, Fiction Records, the new wave subsidiary of Polydor. In August 1980, just as the music press buzz about Scotland was, was building, Fiction released their debut Associates album, The Affectionate Punch. Windswept Never Never Pop. The striking cover image showed Mackenzie and Rankin as athletes hunched over together at the start of a running track. A clean, healthy, faintly Nietzschean image expressing the singer's belief that music, bodily movement and physical fitness were closely related. Bill had been a very good runner. I had been a very good tennis player, recalls Rankin. So that imagery was related to trying to be not superior exactly, but riving above the shit and nonsense of rock and roll and the music business. The album's warm critical reception wasn't matched by popular success, though, and the group parted company with fiction. Mackenzie and Rankin's master plan for 1981 was to make their mark with six singles released in swift succession via the label Situation 2, an imprint of Beggar's Banquet. 1981 is going to be the year of singles, Mackenzie announced. Singles are a lot more fun and disposable, and they've got an air of excitement about them. The singles plan was also something of a scam. Now living in London, the associates desperately needed income. In addition to Mackenzie and Rankin, there was also bassist Mike Dempsey and drummer John Murphy to support. They had wangled money out of a publishing company to record demos, ostensibly to send to major labels, and used, to used the funds to fund ultra-treat graveyard shift sessions at a studio. In a fever of chemically enhanced creativity, for ten weeks, the associates went in every Sunday night and worked until nine in the morning, the substantial difference between what the record recordings cost and what Situation 2 paid for the singles enabled the group to live handsomely. I must stress, there's nothing illegal about what we were doing, says Rankin. It's just that we weren't telling Situation 2 we were making the singles so cheaply, so it felt like a scam to us. The co-producer of the Situation 2 singles, Flood, later to work with Depeche Mode and U2, had spoken of the element of chaos surrounding the sessions. Rankin and Mackenzie were full-on, just hyper-creative and a good laugh. They were pretty fueled, 
and go, go they were pretty fueled and go faster on the sessions and a lot of ridiculous things went on that's the end of the quote eager but naive consumers of drugs they once ended up in hospital after recklessly snorting seven grams of speed they thought it was one gram of cocaine we were just about dead Mackenzie recalled it was the first time i'd taken speed and i didn't know anything about it we just seriously overdosed i was a virgin pharmaceutically freaking out man Rankin recalls the two of them being in the same hospital room on heart machines for four days. Bill was opposite me, so I could see his heart read out, so I could see his heart read out. And when his and when his went to one one fifty eight or one hundred and fifty eight, mine would go up in a panic attack. And when he saw my read out, he would go up even further. His would go up even further. It was just a vicious circle. Consequently, our balls shrank up inside our bodies and our knobs were the size of walnuts. The music the associates produced during these speed adult sessions was psychedelic, not in any literal flashback to 1967 way, but in its pursuit of mutated sounds, saturated textures and unusual instrumentation. We did things like balloon guitar, where you fill a balloon with water until it's the size of a fairly small breast and then get feedback out of your amp and modulate it by wiggling the balloon directly on the strings. We got into glockenspiels, xylophones, vibraphones, but using them in a manic way that hadn't been done before. We also did vocal treatments. Kitchen Person has Bill singing down the long tubing off a vacuum cleaner, while on White Car in Germany, some of the vocals were literally sung through a greaseproof paper and a comb. Possibly the associate's all-time classic, White Car in Germany, taps into the un-American Europe endlessness of Bowie's Berlin trilogy. Mackenzie operatically declaims cryptic lines like Walk on eggs in Munich and Dusseldorf's a cold place, cold as spies can be, over a metronomic march rhythm. There was definitely something old world about the associate's 1981 singles, an ancien regime atmosphere of fading grandeur. Q Quarters, another immortal classic, sounds like Habsburg dub. Its furtive rhythm, broken balalaika, balalaika riff, echoing footsteps and dank electronic atmospheres evokes, evoke Cold War scenarios, the third man and Ip the Ipcris file, partitioned cities, deportations, informers and double agents. Ooh, that's a dark song, says Rankin. I've heard dogs howl to cue quarters, run up out of the room and cover their heads with their paws. Bill just let rip with the imagery. The line, washing down bodies, seemed to me a dead-end chore, comes from his grandma, who had, who had worked in the morgue during the Second World War. Beginning in April 1981 and ending eight months later, the run of, the run of half a dozen singles garnered rave reviews but none got anywhere near the charts. Yet, gathered together in the compilation album Fourth Draw Down, the title referred to the place the group kept the herbal sedative pills that helped them achieve a warm, pleasantly fuzzy come down after the manic Sunday night art sessions. The Associates' 1981 output added up to an astonishing body of work. Mackenzie and Rankin were dissatisfied, though. At the beginning of last year, I thought it was going to be the year of singles, Mackenzie re recollected in an early 1982 interview. And it was. The thing with our singles was that they got peeled off the turntable halfway through. We want to keep our singles on the turntable this year. Their ambition wasn't going to be sated by being critical darlings uh, and cult favourites. They wanted to be the Bowie or Roxy of the 80s. How they managed to pull this off, albeit for just a tantalisingly brief moment of pop time, is a story we'll return to later. By mid-1981, Postcard had also reached an impasse. In many ways, the label had made astonishing strides in an incredibly short period. Orange Juice's second single, Blue Boy, sold nearly 20,000 copies and has been described as a Scottish, Scottish anarchy in the UK for its galvanising effect on new bands north of Hadrian's Wall. With Orange Juice, Joseph K and Aztec Camera singles barraging the upper reaches of the independent chart, Postcard took Scottish pop from a buzz in 1980 to the sound of 1981. London's myopic A&R scouts took heed and started flying up to Glasgow and Edinburgh in their droves. Try as they might though, Postcard couldn't 
propel their groups into the pop charts. In April 1981, Orange Juice's fourth single, Poor Old Soul, was number one in the independent chart, but it reached only number 80 in the real chart. Penetrating the top 75 was the industry definition of a hit. Frustrated, Alan Horne began to contemplate the unthinkable, hooking up Orange Juice with a London major label before the momentum they'd gathered dissipated. It might even be necessary to slap on a coat of gloss over the group's music. Shiny and melodic compared to post-punk, Orange Juice still sounded too scruffy and scratchy in the chart pop context. Meanwhile, Joseph Kay took the next logical step and recorded their debut album. What should have been a triumph turned into a debacle. Sorry for Laughing, as the LP was originally called, sounded too slick for the band's liking. The manic and abrasive edge apparent the manic and abrasive edge apparent when we played live was missing, says Haig. Joseph K proceeded to re-record the entire album, in the process jettisoning some of their best songs. Retitled The Only Fun in Town, it was finally released in June 1981. Retit- excuse me. Only Fun was all recorded in a couple of days, like a Velvet Underground record, says recalls Haig. We purposely drowned out the vocals with guitars in order to get a more live sound. It was an unconscious act of commercial suicide, definitely. With the benefit of hindsight, Malcolm Ross regrets the decision. We should have just released the first version, sorry for laughing. It would have come out six months earlier, so we wouldn't have lost all, the mem- all that momentum we had. Joseph Kay's critical champions Morley at the enemy and McCulloch at, the, at Sounds were horrified by the only fun, feeling the group had betrayed its pop promise and their expectations. Despite the poor reviews, the album figured high in the independent chart and even enjoyed something of a legacy through its influence on a mid-80s and beyond breed of abrasive indie guitar pop, groups like the June Brides and the Wedding Presents. But in 1981, the perception was that Joseph K had missed their moments. By the autumn, the group had split, with Haig going on to pursue an electronic dance direction as Rhythm of Life. In the last months of 1981, Postcard looked out of its step, look, looked out of step. Synths, string sections, and a slickness beyond horns and his group's reach were the new state of the art. Fatally, the Postcard sound was a rock scholar's idea of pure pop. It played fantastically well with the circuit of the music press, John Peel, and the indie charts. But compared to the music of the daytime of daytime Radio One and Top of the Pops, it looked spindly and amateurish. Postcard had played a huge role in turning hipster opinion against the dowdy seriousness of post-punk. Almost single-handedly, they had made melody, fun and love songs cool again. But it was Love Action, the Human League's romance manifesto, that got into the top five, not Orange Juice's simply thrilled honey. Funk was the big buzzword of 1981, but few remembered that Orange Juice's falling and laughing featured a disco bass line, or that the group had precociously celebrated chic. Postcard and Orange Juice had put the concept of pop back on the table, but pop, that cruel mistress, had moved too fast for them to keep up. Or had it? <laughs> 